all yours. Take it away. All right. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming today. Um, I'm Brian McGeary. I'm the Learning Design and Open Education Engagement Librarian at Penn State University. Uh, I was formerly at uh, High University. And I'm joined today by my uh, friend and colleague, Christopher Guter, who is um, the subject librarian for education at Ohio University. And so we're going to discuss how we changed our open education initiatives at Ohio Universities to um, move away from activities like workshops and trainings that were aimed more at um, OER adoption and required a lot of time and labor from uh, librarians to um, a grant initiative that was aimed more at OER creation um, and where librarians took on more of a, a project management role. So it was, it was much less labor intensive for the library and it, uh, which you know, makes it more sustainable and scalable for the library. Um, but it also provided more opportunities for students to become involved um, and you know, actually get to create OER. So I'll turn it over to Chris. He's gonna start us off. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so my name's Chris and I wanted to start with just a picture of our library. Uh, it's done with some sort of a fisheye lens, so it's kind of trippy looking and you really have, would have no idea if you, this is unrecognizable, but at least you get the color. Uh, this is our second floor learning commons. Uh, it was taken by a guy named Thomas Schiff. So Tom, if you're listening, I apologize. Um, okay, so a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about initially in this presentation has to do with labor. And so I thought this little snapshot of what our campus, what our campus library looks like uh, would help you best understand as I move forward our concerns regarding labor. Um, so we are a doctoral university, high research activity. You can see the numbers of faculty of 34,000 students. Uh, probably more important to this though is uh, our ARL statistics, our Association of Research Library Statistics. I, I checked these last week and we are at the bottom of the bottom quartile in terms of late, uh, staffing. So professional staff, support staff, and student and support staff were ranked pretty close to the bottom, uh, 110, 106, and 113. So again, just as we move forward, keep that in mind. Okay. So here are the four uh, open access projects. Uh, we called them initiatives at the beginning. Um, and we started in 2015. So I have like seven minutes to try to rush through five years of, of work. So I apologize for that. Um, but as you see, uh, we started off in 2015 and then we culminated with a, a, a very good grant in 2018, which I will talk about in just a moment. Okay. So 2015, 2016, we created what was called the Alt Textbook Initiative. And the funny thing about this was, you can see by the date, it was right before the elections uh, here in the US. And we did have a faculty member that asked uh, that we change the name. He was a little worried that Alt Textbook would be too confused with the Alt-Right. Um, but I believe he was the only person that actually mentioned that. And so we muscled through and uh, to my knowledge, there were no other complaints. Uh, you can see by the timeline, October 2015 to 2016 to June 2016, I think that's nine months, 10 months, something like that. Pretty long time frame, uh, pretty heavy in terms of staff. Uh, I think we had 12 to 13 librarians working on this uh, workshop and then two to three people outside um, of the libraries, instructional designers, uh, teaching and learning folks. So it was approximately 16 staff members over the course of nine months. Um, the result was one workshop that was offered twice. So it was the same content um, repeatedly offered. Um, so our incentives, $500 if you were a faculty member that was working on a project that with under 99 people, and then you had a stipend of $1,000 if your project, your OER textbook was going to help more than 100 students. This ended up being probably the most pricey of our uh, alt textbook initiative, 16,000, but it did end up in terms of savings, uh, provide approximately $236,000 in textbook savings to students. Um, again, two identical workshops, probably nine months of planning. The next one, uh, 2017, our Alt Textbook 2 initiative. 
Uh, much smaller timeline. I think we were looking at five to six months, but we actually upped the university staff. Uh, we spread it across three units on campus. So we had library staff, we had Office of Innovative Instruction staff, and then we also had um, a partnership with the Scripps College of Communication. So we split the costs. So for the library, it ended up only being $2,000 and then each unit paid $2,000, which is where the, the total cost of 6,000 comes from. And the savings uh, to students was approximately 192,000. Uh, this actually ended up being a lot more work. It involved more staff. It actually changed from one workshop offered twice to six workshops open uh, offered once each time. Uh, and then if you had a faculty member in there, then the librarian had to be present and several of us actually provided content. So I think the picture, the image on the screen right now is one of our A deans giving a, a talk about copyright. So in terms of staffing and in terms of hours, this one actually increased. For 2017, 2018, we started going in the opposite direction. So instead of offering workshops, we ended up offering one workshop where we did not provide the content. Uh, so in this case, we joined OTN, which is now Open Education Network. Uh, they sent staff to our library to present these uh, programs. And then we offered stipends to faculty members who would agree to come to the workshop and then also agree to review an open textbook. Um, now, syllabus streamlining, that's the next component of that year's work. This is something that librarians typically would offer. So in this case, we were really trying to push subject liaisons, meeting up with faculty to talk about finding either library purchase content or OER to insert into syllabus, into, into syllabi, uh, and instead of textbooks and cost saving students money. And then the third component of that year was uh, we purchased B-Press to start an institutional repository. And we call our uh, repository the Ohio Open Library. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a second. So lastly, before I hand this off to Brian, we got, uh, Brian and I, as well as uh, Dr. Ganeshan, received a grant in 2018. It's a $20,000 grant, and it was meant to encourage OER adoption uh, and aimed specifically at undergrads. So I had $20,000 over two years uh, to create these projects, which you see on the screen. Um, the one thing it could not pay for was faculty stipends. So we were sort of, um, we were sort of handcuffed in that regard. We could not pay faculty for their work, but what ended up happening was we changed the way we looked at these projects and we ended up producing, uh, I would say some, some projects here that I'm pretty proud of uh, with relatively low cost. So I'll just walk through these really quickly. So the Art History Test Bank, this ended up being probably our most valuable uh, project. It ended up saving approximately $52,000 a year in student savings from textbooks. What I did, um, so the Art History, Entry Level Art History class, they had already committed to using OER products, um, but what they did not have was a test bank. And the, the professor I was talking with said, you know, this is the, one of the most time consuming components of this. We really want to use OER, but the creation of a test bank is problematic. I paid a graduate student to work with that faculty member to just create hundreds of questions for that test bank. And then those test banks uh, can then be added to year after year. Um, it's a product that's not gonna go away. And as I said, it was a $52,000 savings. Uh, the Occupational Health and Safety textbook uh, this professor wanted to change textbooks. He'd been using the same one for many years. And since this particular discipline, a lot of it is uh, government related and open access already. I paid a, a graduate student to work with that faculty member to take his written com, uh, content, as well as the free stuff that she could find online and dump it into something, into B Press. So you can see the, at the bottom of the slide that, that green cover, that's one of the two volumes that they ended up creating for the Occupational Health and Safety uh, course. The journalism course, they had already made the transition to a Safari, well, O'Reilly 
book, um, which the library has um, in their collection uh, digitally. So essentially to the student, it's a free textbook. Um, but what they didn't have was the supplemental workbook and media content. So that's what I ended up paying. I ended up paying a student to help that faculty create the content. The Human and Consumer Science Project was just a straightforward syllabus streamline. So um, that professor taught online courses. They were going to use Top Hat, and they just wanted to find readings that they could drop into Top Hat in exchange for the textbook. So that was that. The Spanish Linguistics textbook, which Brian will talk about in just a second, um, was actually one of my favorite projects, and I'll just I'll let Brian talk about that in a minute. Uh, so savings estimates. You can see here in the middle, this is how much of the grant money was spent on each of those projects. Um, so I think it, roughly about $13,000. I returned about $7,000 to the actual, to the, to the university and unused grant funds. And then over here on the right, you can see the project savings. So savings in textbooks, as well as the number of students affected by those textbooks every year. Um, so it's roughly $80,000 saved, um, which is lower than the previous initiatives. But I think, and where we're going with this is that instead of librarian labor, instead of functional librarians and subject librarians and A deans spending their time on it, you have one librarian who is a project manager and that project manager oversees the students that are working on these, on these projects. So you, you save a lot of time and the ability is, uh, amplified that you could have multiple more than five projects going at a time and, and create that kind of savings. Um, I think this is you, Brian. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so in addition to, you know, the, the cost savings aspect of all of this, um, the grant was also able to support faculty in terms of, um, you know, going beyond just OER adoption to um, having some pedagogical innovation and, and getting students to um, actually be involved in the creation of OER. Um, specifically, this uh, linguistics uh, textbook that I'm gonna talk about a little bit um, is, is a really great example of um, you know, how, how faculty were able to um, incorporate open pedagogy into um, their courses. And if you'd like to uh, read more about it, um, we have a, a chapter about it. Um, there's a link on the screen there. Uh, there'll also be a link on the final slide, but if you could go ahead to the next slide, please, Chris. So this uh, particular project was, was motiva motivated by the fact that um, the existing uh, commercial textbooks in this area um, were written at a level that was um, beyond uh, the proficiency that, that her students had with um, both with Spanish and with linguistic concepts. Um, and so what she decided to do uh, was to actually have students uh, work on projects that would create a new textbook. And so there were a lot of uh, different assignments that were built into the course over time. and. Um, from semester to semester, um, additional assignments would be built in that would uh, contribute more content to this textbook. And initially, it, it came out of a, a study guide assignment that uh, Dr. Ganesh and I worked uh, together to um, create a rubric for uh, as part of a, a separate uh, workshop series. Um, but the, the, the grading for this particular uh, course is done based on uh, specifications grading. So students are given either credit or no credit. So they're, they're not having to focus so much on grade and can focus more on process and on learning. Um, and also they're given the, the opportunity to revise, which again, helps them to focus on learning, but it also yields uh, a final product that you know is a little bit closer to uh, being ready to publish. Go to the next slide, please, Chris. Um, so anytime you're doing you know, some sort of uh, work with students, you really have to, to be uh, cognizant of uh, their agency. And so with this particular project, students were able to opt in so they didn't have, have to um, have their contributions go into the final textbook if they didn't want to. And um, so that there was no sort of undue pressure put on them, they would fill out a form that was handed into the uh, departmental um, 
administrative assistant who would hold on to those until after final grades were handed in. Um, I also did a workshop on Creative Commons uh, for the students so that they understood more about Creative Commons and open licensing and were able to actually make the decision for themselves about how they wanted to uh, license the textbook. And so the, the students were, were the ones who, who chose uh, the license for it. Go to the next slide, please, Chris. Uh, in addition to the students in the course who were uh, contributing content, the grant also paid for student editors to work on the, on the project. And so these were students who had um, greater proficiency with Spanish and with, with linguistics. And they helped with a, a lot of different things like editing and organizing um, the content but also incorporating more content to help keep it up to date and um, working on an audio version of the textbook as well. Go to the next slide, please. Um, in addition to those students, uh, there were also some contributions from a fine arts student who was paid to um, draw illustrations for the, for the textbook and also um, an alumna of the university who is a current uh, employee um, also was responsible for designing the cover of the textbook. And next slide, please, Chris. So there were a lot of benefits for students beyond just the, the cost savings aspect of it. Um, this was really a much more um, engaging learning experience where they you know, were doing something more than just disposable assignments and um, were able to you know, be knowledge creators themselves. Um, and then the, the student editors who were working on this uh, also learned some specialized skills um, as far as you know, putting this into press books and editing and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, another benefit of the fact that this was done in an open format was that because this is such a time consuming process done over multiple semesters, um, chapters were able to be put into use in the course as they were completed rather than having to wait for the, the entire textbook to be completed. And I'll hand it back over to Chris uh, to wrap it up. Thanks, Brian. Um, I, on the slide here, you can just see some recommendations. I, I think they're they might be specific to us, uh, but depending on how your your institution handles this kind of thing. Um, again, if funding's an issue, I would suggest working towards fewer library staff whose salaries are higher, and instead pay student employees when possible to do this kind of work. Um, and I, I think it benefits them. As Brian said, it, it, helps, uh, it helps with their CVs. They have a project they can point to. It's not a disposable um, assignment. It's something that's out there and can live on. Uh, if money is available, I think stipends and incentives seem to be attractive. Um, and then as a sub bullet, uh, try to encourage funders um, to be more flexible and to allow for those types of stipend purchases or purchases for those uh, stipends as initiatives. Um, because I think in our case, it really would have uh, helped us uh, get more projects going. Um, if dedicated professional staff are limited or non-existent, move towards project management. Again, uh, the 1804 grant for the most part was just me um, signing time cards and hiring students to do the work. And um, dealing with faculty and making sure everything is running smoothly. And then lastly, uh, faculty and staff leave, uh, so plan accordingly. Um, I'm needing to figure out some ways to move projects forward now that some faculty have left. So uh, it happens everywhere, but um, yeah, just plan accordingly, I guess. And I believe that is it, yes. Um, so I, I, we're here for a while, I guess. I don't know if there's time, but if you have any questions, uh, we can try to answer them. I love the presentation, guys. So, so inspiring.